Hello everyone, it is that time of the year again, with a new set release, this time it's Modern Horizons 3, where me, the other guy and Sprotki will go through the motions of opening up a pre-release kit and build a 40 card deck for it, which we can guide through the pre-release and try to win as many games as possible. Just like with last time, we are not gonna go through all the cards and read out every card like most of the openings do. We are trying to concentrate on checking out what cards are going best and build the most coherent deck possible. To give you the feel of what the experience would be in a sealed event or a release event you might want to attend. Generally speaking, pre-releases is, can be the most casual, most uh, laid-back and relaxed event possible, as many people only are here for checking out new cards and maybe try to get some funky stuff. Therefore, if you've never been anywhere something like this before, I highly recommend to do So first things first, let's open up a kit using the pool that provided. Then, as you can see, there are some punch-out counters which are relevant to the format. Inside there is the box with the boosters and you can click out those windows and see what the artwork is inside of the box. So, inside the second box in a box you will find the spin down life counter in case you need one. These can be different styles depending on the set. Then we will have the promo card package and the six booster packs, six place booster packs it is. So we are opening up the promo pack and inside of it there will be a promo card. Uh, in this set there is a couple of extra cards for your double faced cards and the arena code which I already used so therefore there's no point posing and trying to snipe it from me. Thank you very much. While opening the packs I will skip forward when I organized everything so you don't have to watch me in complete silence organizing all the cards in colors. In the meantime, let me talk about our wonderful website which we created. It's the UK exclusive marketplace where people like you and me, well, not me as I'm not allowed, but people like you can put up their own leftover cards and try to sell it to other people. We are going to leave a link down in the comments below. So please check it out, register and start making some money you spent on this card game. Thank you and we are back from our sponsored message from ourselves and here you can see past me looking at that big juicy address which I opened and be excited about to maybe try and play it. There I can check the, the lands we opened as there is a lot of color fixing in this format which the report says it's a hard three color format so I'm trying to identify what sort of colors I can reliably play and what are the options here in terms of what color combinations I can reliably get to. So, looks like from the initial ideas that most of our things will be black based, given the Phyrexian Tower and the, the, the black land, utility land. So I'm looking through all the cards and I'm checking all the options which one of the colors I can find for it. As you can see, these uh, common landscape lands are pretty reasonably utilized as they can be tapping colorless mana for your Eldrazi needs, searching three different types of basic lands, and if you search, fix them out, then you can actually use them to draw it away as a cycling ability. Then, after a quick double check with the red and white cards, to make sure we don't miss anything important, we decided to cut them completely as a starting point. And then, had a second time admiration for that big juicy address we opened without the colorless monocost. So we are trying to build a ramp deck as a base strategy. Therefore, probably green is one, will be one of our most important colors. And just to double check what are the options there. For ramping. Then I remember the procedures. And I will start organizing the cards by mana cost. 
as the usual creatures on top and other spells on the bottom style. So 2 mana, 3 mana and so on. We will cut this bit as well because it's just time consuming while you're watching me bubbling around and trying to figure out how to put numbers next to each other. And we are back here with our pile of cards. Nicely organized. Nicely, I mean nicely. As you can see here, I included a red card there because it creates two Eldrazi spawns and every time you sacrifice an Eldrazi you get bonus. Plus one, plus one counters on this creature. And also I realized because I have so many landscapes with search for red mana, it basically felt like an auto include where I can get away with only one mountain to play in the deck. And now we are trying to check out how many actual Eldrazis I have in the pool because I wanted to play all of them as much or as much of them as possible. Which uh, ended up being a reasonable thing. Then I realized I still have a white card left in the deck for some mystical reason. So I correct this problem. And now we are looking at the, the actual cards which generates as mana since if we want to play an Eldrazi Ram deck, this is also the point when I will actually start reading the cards and double checking what they do and what they don't. Then now I can start thinking about what sort of cards I want to include and what sort of cards I really don't need in the deck. As you can see, I will start organizing them with potentials if I wanted to play them or not, but I'm still trying to prioritize the cards which gives me mana after realizing that I have more than enough Eldrazi spawn generation and other mana acceleration to play my beloved Eldrazi, then I look through that the high-end cards, as I always said before, my natural inclination is to play an aggressive strategy with low to the ground curve, so I can play more active cards and less lands if possible. Starting the cuts, I always go with the non-creature cards first, and our first victim of the cuts will be card which only kills flying creatures, therefore it is mostly a sideboard bubble option. Collective resistance is a similar card to it, therefore it has to go, but then on second choice I make, make my decision of temporarily include it currently, as, as the modality might have fringe implications in the main deck as well. Then I go through and try to see removal spells, how many of those things I have and I end up cutting one of them as it requires swamps in your field to be effective which I think with the three color deck and so many non-basic lands I will not have too many swamps in the first place to be ever be effective. As you can see I pointed collective resistance as a, as a card there because I am, I am reasoning there that our all the modes might be relevant and also that one of the modes is a pseudo counter spell where you can defend your creature from sprout removal. Then uh, we cut the, the bobo because it's not really a, a, a card I feel like which is good in limited at all apart from being cute and it's a 1 mana spell. Then I double check the fairy and I realize that in order to have it effective I need to draw three cards in a turn, which I'm now checking whether I will have any options to draw three cards. And as you can see, there isn't many. I mean, three cards is a lot. Like one, one card you draw every turn, and then afterwards, a, a second a country spell or a draw one card is nice and reasonable. But having a third one is probably a, a far-fetched dream. Therefore, that also has to go. Then, after a bit of housekeeping, when I realize that I have a creature hiding in the non-creature cards, I focus my attention into the high mana cost cards. As I said before, and my natural inclination is play low to the ground decks in limited, where especially in pre-releases, where most people try to play as many funky, fancy, big mana cost cards as possible, so you always have a reasonable chance to, just to curve out and put them to the test. Then I start looking at the non-creature cards and why they are so expensive and whether I need them or not. 
There are two cards there in my hand, which are both uh, high mana cost low impact cards on their own. One of them is just a 6-6 a six, six creature with a, an equipment attached to it, therefore it has to go. And there I know that I will have to cut some of the high mana value cards. Here I admire a bit more of the baby brother of Wormcoil engine, therefore I know I have to play it. But I want to cut at least two cards from the from those high-end mana cards of creatures. Then we go back to the aggressive strategy and the, and the low-end cards. I double check and triple check every card again. As you can see, these are really, these are the agonizing decisions you have to make. And I know that I have to cut down on the two mana creatures because it's not possible to play 15 of them. It just doesn't fill the format for it. And here at this point I kind of try to make a decision whether I'm gonna play base green black splashing blue and that one red card. Or whether I will play playing green and blue splashing black. As you can see here I am looking at things and trying to organize stuff. And my natural inclination is to play the black cover and the green base. As you can see, most of my high-end creatures have, and high-end cards have multiple black pips in them. And after double-checking my cards, I realized that I have a sub-team of plus one reasonable plus one plus one counters, which is which is mostly a green-black strategy. Therefore, probably the blue cards will be the ones which will end up in the chopping block. Checking the cards one by one and fingering out my options. So as I said, the mana cards has to stay. The plus one plus one counter has to stay. The card row has to stay. Therefore, the double phrased cards can go. And here we are at the point where you can start counting the number of cards in the hope that magically they will end up at 24 even after a while and you know there's no. Then I find another interesting card which cares about your devotion to black which I didn't notice before therefore I will quickly discard it as I said we don't really have that many permanents and it's, it doesn't feel like very impactful in a deck of ours. Then the high mana cost cards I really want all of them because all of them look good so again a quick double count again Maybe there is another card magically disappear from the pack. It never does. Just letting you know, it never does. But it's always nice to double check and triple check just in case you are making a mistake. For example there, I've convinced myself to cut that card, which is 5 mana draw 3 cards. Which in hindsight might have been a mistake. But as at 5 mana and it's not actually impacting the, the board straight up. I felt like at the time that it's probably something I can cut. Then I will start going back to the non-land cards again and trimming th things down which are not impacting the board straight away. As you can see, the vehicle has to go as well. Circling back into the topic where I mentioned that in hindsight cutting one of the cards might have been a mistake. This is an important thing to note about releases that the rules are not very strict on what to play and what not to play. So as you don't register your deck pretty much for the, for play, you can play any card in any game possible. So if you want to if you don't like the deck you built in the first round, you can always go back and just rebuild your deck completely. You can start every game with a different deck. You don't have to wait for sideboarding like in normal tournament style magic. This is something important to note. And here I finally make the decision after so many agonizing minutes to actually cut down as many blue cards as possible. Just to cut, 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 cut a simple color might make my choices easier. Obviously I'm gonna stay, keep the, the card row spell. The card draw creature with the scry ability because it just feels really impactful and then double counting my creatures i end up at a point where i only need to cut two more creature cards to have a complete deck and then we have to go through still back to the to the non-creature spells since i am not really wanting to play uh, blue cards i realize that even though that card is really good 
I will put it on the side as a, as a model double face card for maybe to play 16 or even 15 lands. I'm not quite sure whether this is a correct decision or not, but you can let me know down in the comments below whether you feel like this is a low land count format or a high land count. Back to cuts and back to the two mana cards cards. I find another one which is should have been much more easier. The living weapon cards, I don't think they are very impactful. Uh, I mean, apart from a non-land card giving you an extra creature here and there. But it's definitely something you can cut easily and much more readily than you should be doing it beforehand. Going through, going back, going forward and trying to justify all the cards I am playing and to save some of your time, we are going to jump forward a bit in time where I am actually making decisions instead of you watching me shuffling cards back and forth and trying to justify everything else again. And when we are back again, as you can see, I end up cutting, finally, I end up cutting most of the blue cards and the double blue spells. I don't know, honestly, I have no idea how it took me this long to figure it out. That I cannot be reasonably playing three colors of multiple basic land uh, requirements. And then, again, another count uh, reveals us that we have... 28 cards in the pool currently as potential playable cards so I need to cut down to at least four more cards and this is where the the actual decisions which I always feel like it matters takes place As you can see now I only have four cards which cost more than four mana so we are at the position where we wanted to be in the start so at this point I feel like those cards are untouchable and then I have to double triple check everything I have to make sure that I can do. I ended up putting back the black removal spell which again I said in hindsight was a mistake because in this format you're never gonna deal in this deck, in this format, you're never gonna deal more than two damage with it, which is not impactful enough because all the reason, all the cards which matter, are at the high end bits. So my advice would be to past me to end up cutting that card instead of the other cuts I'm going to make. Again, another count, hoping that I miscounted and it's only 24 cards, but it's. That's always just a feeble dream. And here is the one of the decisions which I felt like is correct. Where I'm thinking about Buried Alive, as it used to be my pet card way back in Odyssey days too. Therefore I really really want to try it out. And because I have a couple of creatures which can use be useful and come back from the graveyard. And also the white which gets bigger and bigger with the number of creatures in your graveyard. I feel like it has its place in the deck as a as an effective uh, boost to our strategy here. Even though I end up temporarily cutting it along with my other three mana cards, because I don't feel like it's ever gonna be relevant. And after that, we have our obligatory thinking and reshuffling and card counting again. We are down to 24 cards, which is a reasonable amount of cards which I can play with, as I can play 16 or 17 lands, and yes, you heard it correctly, I like to play 20, 17 lands with 24 cards, I always get a lot of stick for it, but uh, this is just a personal preference, which you really hard to have to convince me not to do, right? So, and then again, I am... Um, Wanting to adding back up Buried Alive and I discuss in length the options with the white and the two recurring creature, the one mana and the two mana eternalizable creature, plus the the, the effect of uh, one of my three mana cards which uh, can bring back permanence from my graveyard into hand. But then again if I want to play it I have to find another cut for it. And uh, after going through all the options and all the cards with all the possible recursions, I 
make a, a decision and finally convince myself that I do have to play that card. But then again, the important question we have to ask ourselves then, that if I want to play a buried alive, then what is the card I have to take out? And I end up taking and I end up taking out the wrong two mana card, which would have helped me immensely to sort out my issues with the deck, as gives me card selection and also an extra ramp spell over the, as I said, the two mana consuming corruption. And now we are at a point where I think will be the most interesting and most impactful thing to do in this format, namely the building of a mana base. For people like me who like the puzzle element most about limited formats, I think this will be the most fun and most interesting brain exercise you can do. Since I'm playing black and green, I choose to pick all the non-basic lands which produce black or green or being able to find anything for me. And I keep all of the landscapes which at least search for two of my basic lands which I need for the deck. And after one last bit of housekeeping and a bit of organization, let's see what, let's see what deck we finished with at the end. So, sorry for the moving camera. So we have a reasonable curve with the classic 2 mana, 3 mana cards and a bit of high end to finish the game with. In order to get to the high end we have plenty of mana acceleration through the Eldrazi spawns and a couple of cards which gives us enough mana to easily cast our 10 mana creature with the colorless manas and the other is prompt creation both ways plus the fanatic of Ronas. Then we do have a couple of cards for card advantage purposes. We have a reasonable amount of cards which gives plus one plus one counters more than once. So we can actually go through and raise our creatures bigger to win the late game and also to help us use our creatures which they get extra triggers when you get plus one plus one counters on them. We have the recursive creature again where if we put more than one counter on it or more than once a counter on it we, we can retake any of our lost permanents. And of course as I said we have our new favorite, my new favorite card here which is basically a serum visions on a pair for the exact same mana cost. And for our mid to late game creature wise we have a couple of good cards, namely one on Eldrazi which gets bigger and it creates also a number of spawns, plus, plus an Uzbek which gives us another form of evasion with trample with all the plus one plus one countered creatures. Then we have the big cards to finish the game hopefully. We have an Ulamog which is the 10 mana should win you the game or at least make the opponent's life hard enough. Then we have a pretty decent 3-3 three, three, for 5 with Death Touch and Lifelink. And then when it dies, it splits into two creatures, one of them with Death Touch, one of them with Lifelink. And we have a 5 mana 6-6 six, six flyer, which creates card advantage for us in the form of blood tokens. Or alternatively, if you sacrifice enough creatures, we can reanimate our whole graveyard onto the board creature-wise. That's our creature base for by the looks of it. Then on the spells wise we have a couple of removal spells, a buried alive and a pretty reasonable evasion giving lifelink enchantment which can, helps, can help us to turn the tide of the game or just finish the game on its own as it makes anything into a potential threat. Overall at this point past me is pretty happy with the deck. As I said, in hindsight, probably I would have taken out the Consuming Corruption for an Ada card, which actually does something on a 2 mana slot, but uh, that's a lesson learned late, um, later on. And now for the basic land mana base finishing touches. As explained beforehand, normally I do have a system where I use a proportion of the colored mana symbols on cards to figure out my creatures. Uh, to figure out my land base but in this format because of so I have so many fetches and everything else I ended up with I ended up with nine non basic lands so I am gonna play seven eight I end up playing eight uh, basic lands 
So at this point, having uh, actual exact calculations is not really relevant. That's why I feel. So I have one, two, three, four, four blue cards. And for that, but we, my reasoning is that every one of my fetch land searches for blue. I can get away with playing a single blue mana source. Because I'm never going to need more than one blue mana in any turn cycle. That's the same goes with the uh, mountain. So at this point, doing a double count, I figure out that I only have to play 8 basic lands here. Which will be green and black. So after not much thinking involved, as I'm kind of running out of time at this point. I do another count and figure out that I can play 4 and 4 easily as most of my uh, mana acceleration is green as usual but I also need multiple black sources for my top end plus some of my early, early cards I also require black mana. There is another thing I almost forgot to talk about and check it is basically the all your layer lands in order to come down untapped you need to have the basic land type in your deck which gives you the same color of mana so for shifting woodlands you need a forest in play and for spy masters vote you need a swamp in play therefore it is really important to have both of them in my deck in an equal quantities because i don't really want them to play them untapped also we have one more model double faced card which i'm pointed taps for basically a black mana in our deck is the white mana will become irrelevant but sometimes that's important as well plus we have a phyrexian tower which only gives me black mana uh, for a creature but it can accelerate me into my high end cards into my 10 mana card as well as this is the dream as you can see i am figuring out the putting out which basic lens i'm gonna use i have a huge stack of revised basic lands therefore I always carry them with me into releases so I can play with basic lands of the same art style this is just a minor thing it's for mostly for purposes of hiding information in case your opponent was able to look at your hand so they cannot figure out which land you draw and which cards you draw when it comes to that but that's just a minor technicality really after the swamps are so decided now we go on to the painful process of finding the same four forests in a pile of land cards which will be available to use after finishing the stylish touches and putting away everything else we don't need we go through one more time of all the cards as you can see the four forests the four swamps the one plains the non-basic lands and one less double check the cards just in case this becomes relevant actually because at this is the point when I find out that I almost made a fatal mistake of including a card which red mana cost in it but no mountains as you can see past me doubles and triple checks and now the penny drops and I end up putting us mountain into the deck as well so that's pretty much how i ended up with this deck the results were not as good as last time when we went undefeated but as they say it cannot be christmas every day that's about it for today let us know in the comments below uh, what you would have changed or played differently maybe have a little talk about what what you opened in your pre-release how it went and as always, if you like what you see, please do like and subscribe to the video for us to be able to allow to do more of these things as we quite like them. Thank you very much. Bye.